Hello everyone and welcome back to the Up and Coming Artist Podcast. I'm Ben, an animator. And it's just me today. <laughs> uh, at the time that I'm recording this podcast, Christian is currently on a plane with his wife to their honeymoon. <laughs> so congrats to them. And Christian will be back uh, next time. And actually, uh, the interview that we have today with my good friend Miguel Baltazar of DreamWorks TV, uh, Christian was actually there for that recording. So you'll hear him in just a minute. Um, but just know that at the time I'm recording these intros and outros, Christian is out. So I know if he was here, he would wish you all the best in all of your artistic endeavors. So anyway, it's just me today. So last episode with Maureen Martinez, hopefully you guys were able to check that out. We talked about storyboarding and that our next episode was going to be about storyboarding. Well, our next conversation was about storyboarding. <laughs> um, because I've been busy with my job at Stupid Buddy Studios, I uh, haven't been able to edit as many. And some of you have been asking about what are these part one and part two episodes that you're putting out? And well, basically, it's just that I have less time to edit. So I'm splitting them into two parts. Um, but it, uh, another reason why I split this episode and conversation into two parts is because I know that a lot of the people who are listening are up and coming artists who are looking at getting into the industry, you know, regardless of whatever industry it is, whether it's animation, uh, you know, even fine arts, the literary arts, such as writing, uh, the performing arts, music, dance, theater, all this good stuff. A lot of people are looking at, you know, how, how do you even get into the industry? And so I have split up this conversation with my friend Miguel in order to kind of accommodate that. So in the first part, Miguel talks about getting to DreamWorks TV, which is where he works now. And in the second part, which I'll put up hopefully next week for you guys, is um, what he's doing now at DreamWorks TV as a storyboard revisionist. And what's fun about anyone working in whatever industry it is, is that I feel like no two people get in the same way. And I think even Jordan Harrow talked about that way back in episode four. Uh, and so it's fun for me uh, to see a friend of mine who's worked so, so hard to be where he's at. And in this episode, to be able to hear his story of how he got there. So hopefully you guys enjoy this first part of Mine and Christian's conversation with storyboard revisionist Miguel Baltazar of DreamWorks TV and how we got there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Up and Coming Artist Podcast. I'm Ben, an animator. And I'm Christian, a filmmaker. When you say filmmaking, Christian, you know what it makes me think of? Does it make you think of storyboarding? That's right. And who better to talk to than my friend who is an animator? Illustrator, character designer, comic artist, live streamer, but most importantly, storyboard revisionist at DreamWorks TV. And he is Miguel Baltazar. Oh my god, guys. Oh my god. I'm a fat, <laughs> fat boy. Your, your makeup is okay. running. Oh okay. my goodness. <laughs> I know, my makeup's running. I'm sorry, guys. At least it's a podcast. You can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start off the podcast by giving you two guys a shout out. Oh. Yeah. He actually listens to it. We're starting this this movement of of this podcasting, and I want to say thank you guys for making some amazing podcasts. I listened to in the car actually on my long commute to Glendale from Anaheim. So yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, well, thank you for <laughs> listening to it, man. Um, I did list off a few things that you've done, but I know that you've done more. So is there anything else that you'd add to that description of yourself? Can you do, uh, read the list again? Yeah. <laughs> wow, I was getting excited. Uh, <laughs> well, I did I, that? You, oh, do, oh. <laughs> well, you work in animation, though you weren't an animation major. So I have that kind of as a pseudo. He's an animator. But more so, illustrator, character designer, comic artist. Mm. So if you look on your mm -hmm. Instagram, you got mm -hmm. a lot of that. Um, you also do live streams. Oh, which, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is super exciting. We'll get into that later on. Sweet. But really what we want to talk about today, because because um, you listen to the podcast, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we get people on who are really up and coming. They're still in school, but you've been in the industry for some time. Yeah. So we want to talk particularly about DreamWorks TV. Okay. All right. So DreamWorks TV is like the best. 
Um, I started off as an intern at DreamWorks TV uh, towards my last year of school. So I kind of I kind of got really lucky landing an internship like close to graduation. And so with DreamWorks TV, uh, basically it's like the division uh, of TV at DreamWorks Feature. Um, a lot of times like people get confused with like what, how it works with like TV and Feature. Um, I think the big thing for people to know is that like Feature Campus is the campus where they make the movies such as like Boss Baby, uh, Trolls, uh, other films like that. And then TV is the division where like they make their TV shows specifically for streaming services such as Netflix and then now uh, particularly Amazon Prime and Ooh. they're expanding too uh, to other platforms. And so DreamWorks TV like has a bunch of shows like, you know, the Boss Baby back in business TV show uh, as well as like, you know, other TV shows that they kind of expanded upon from other films like Home, uh, Puss in Boots, King Julian or All Hail King Julian. Um, there are other shows too, but really like DreamWorks TV is, uh, I think like a really strong uh it has a really strong presence in the TV animation community. Um, I think now a lot more people are leaning towards DreamWorks TV. I know Netflix is up and coming too, um, but the thing is that like DreamWorks TV has so many talented artists, particularly like a lot of artists who are very uh, popular on, on social media, especially Instagram. And so for me, DreamWorks TV was like the ideal scenario because there's so much freedom mm. uh, at DreamWorks TV. I know a lot of people have a fear of... Um, like having a certain company uh, kind of like, you know, limit you creatively mm -hmm. and having that like businessy, like bureaucratical culture kind of get in the way of creativity. But I think DreamWorks is like one of the more liberal, more progressive animation studios mm -hmm. um, because like, it's funny. Um, I'll talk about the specific layout of the, the company. So we're not really at Feature Campus. Um, even though Universal bought DreamWorks because of us TV, uh, we actually are like in this distant like 24 story building five minutes away from uh, yeah. Feature Campus. So like when people go to campus, like that's DreamWorks. I feel like that's like how DreamWorks should look like. But like DreamWorks TV is kind of like in this building, uh, this 24 story building, right? building yeah. where it's kind of scattered. Like we don't have consecutive floors. So we have a floor. We have a uh, we're on the second floor, <laughs> the sixth floor, the seventh floor. And then we're on the 24th and 25th floor. And right. that makes up, that's basically DreamWorks TV is just those five floors that are scattered. So you get on the elevator with someone from just like an accounting firm or something. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like, <laughs> yeah. oh my God. Okay, okay. I'm going to act it out. I, I yeah, know this is a podcast. It. I know they can't see me, but it's like, I come in, I'm like, oh, but DreamWorks. And it's then you go in and like, you, you, we have our badges because, and thankfully it's secure. So you scan our badges to go up to a certain floor. And um, so we scan them like, oh, I don't know when DreamWorks. And then someone comes in and like, they just look so, like, they just look so beat so worn out. <laughs> and they're like, okay, that guy's not at DreamWorks. Definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're scanning, they're scanning the, their badges. And, like, mm. and then I'm just like, mm. you I look mean, depressed. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. In my head, I'm like, oh my God, I hope you have a good day. You know? Yeah. <laughs> because like, it's just it, funny, the career choice that, you know, like people make. But it's just funny, like just seeing people's reactions. Like I'm very observant with that. And right. I think it's funny when you kind of, you know, you go up to a floor and people see, like, you know, the signs of the shows that are, you know, that are there. Because um, you can clearly see, like, a sign to, like, a show and, like, which direction it is on the floor. Oh, cool. So people are just, like, like looking at me like, oh, man. You know? Yeah, they accidentally <laughs> kinda, clicked the wrong uh, they, floor and they're yeah. like, oh, I wish I was working here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they, they redesigned the whole floor. It's great. Yeah. And then they realize it's DreamWorks and then they're like, oh, sh shoot. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I was close. My yeah. goal in this podcast is not to cuss. I don't want okay. you to have to put the harmonica thing on there. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a personal goal of mine to not okay. cuss. Okay, we'll, gotcha. we will uh, hold you to it. Here's eat some uh, M&Ms. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I could just... That's right. <laughs> no, it's a reward. Reward yourself yeah, for holding that's right. back. That's right. Well, that's awesome, man. And, you know, I I do want to get into you getting that internship, which is yes. how you first got there. Yes. But because you've been mentioned on the podcast before, so this is back in uh, episode five, I want to say, oh, Joel, wow. oh, you, yeah. you've known Joel Zamudio for uh, how long? <laughs> yeah. gotta, we got to oh, start okay. with that. Both of you went to OSHA, right? No, actually. Okay, this goes farther than that farther okay this even goes before like this even goes as far back as before we were even born okay oh so you guys oh, are mature oh, oh, oh. No, i'm just kidding <laughs> i'm just kidding Sorry. is there a prophecy about to happen <laughs> yes yes okay romulus and remus <laughs> yeah <laughs> just kidding oh my god yeah it, it's it's kind of like harry potter and and yeah and like you know the the marauder's map kind of thing yeah. so yeah. um our dads knew each other like years ago so my dad i immigrated from mexico to the u.s um, and then um, Joel's dad did the same thing and it was around the same time they kind of emigrated both to the US and um, they lived they, they actually kind of met in Anaheim where I live now but uh, they were trying to like you know 
look for places to stay. And I think they both met at the hospital my dad still works at. My dad's actually going to celebrate his like 40th anniversary wow. working at the West Anaheim Medical Center. That's like three minutes from my house. Shut up. And so, yeah, shut yeah. up. Oh and West Anaheim Medical Center. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so they, they met at the hospital. And at that time, my dad was living with uh, his, uh, my uncles, um, I think like three or four other uncles. And so he asked uh, Joel's dad, hey, like, you know, we're living in this big house or like we're living in this house altogether. Uh, do you want to stay? And so, like, Joel's dad said, yeah, sure. And so they were actually roommates for the longest time. Wow. And, and and I didn't know that. I think I knew that. I think I found out, like, a couple years ago. I didn't know that, like, their friendship had gone as far back as that. I knew they worked together, but I didn't realize that they were roommates. Wow. And so uh, they lived, Joel's dad lived there for a couple years until he met, um, you know, Joel's mom. And they got married, and then they moved out. And then um, when um Joel's brother was born like my mom took care of his older brother and then um, when Joel was born like basically my mom would babysit Joel and that's how I met him we basically met when we were babies wow and we didn't even know each other you we guys are the living that... rugrats yeah, exactly. yeah seriously oh my god oh my god and, and and we we both had that love for drawing early on so we kind of like both drew a lot as little kids and I remember like Joel Joel has a special place in my heart because I remember when 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 we were kids he would bring like paper and like markers and stuff and I'm like I've never seen anyone do that like, you know, because I did the same thing, too. I'm like, wow, like, there's someone else like me as an yeah. artist who, who wants to draw. He's like, yeah, I'm drawing this. And, and, and like, Joel's better than me. And he was better than me uh -huh. back then. Because for me, like, uh, my parents just kind of, like, unintentionally, like, made me into who I am, an artist. <laughs> like, they, they uh, would bring, like, these, because, like, they didn't speak any, like, they, they spoke little English. They didn't know much about, like, the pop culture at the time. Um, but they knew that I, like, they needed to entertain me. And so I'm going off on a tangent, but this is no, a I want to hear it. And I'll lead, I'll lead back into your question. But they would bring, like, all these VHS tapes, and they'd bring, like, some of the best movies. Like, they would bring, like, they, they had Aladdin in Spanish, which was awesome. Oh, nice. And then they also had, like, Toy Story 2, and then they had um, uh, A Bug's Life. And, like, those movies were, like, transformative for me because I remember even as a little kid, like, I was so transfixed in them. And I remember Joel and I would have these conversations about the movies we'd watch. And even then, too, I'm like, this, this person's talking about these movies in a way that I talk about, you know, movies to other people. And so from there, like, our friendship was really there. And I remember uh, Martin, his older brother, brought uh, The Mummy Returns. Uh, nice. And that was, like, the first time I've ever seen some sort of, like, like any sort of action movie to that extent. I've only seen, like, animated films and stuff like that. And I remember it was, like, one of the best days ever because we were all watching that movie and I was just so blown away by yeah. the movie. Dwayne now it The Rock sucks. Johnson. Yeah. yeah, now it kind of sucks. <laughs> but at that time, I was like, whoa, like, the visual effects and everything. That was the first time I'd seen a film with, like, visual effects that I thought were amazing. Yeah. And I remember, I was like, it was one of the best days just seeing a movie with, like, th this group of people and just, you know, enjoying it. And so, like, Joel and I's friendship, like, expanded, you know, like, it started since then. And, uh, but sadly, like, because, you know, he had to go to school and stuff and everything, like, our, our families just, you know, didn't talk as much just because things happen, life moves yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. And um, so, in the end, like, I didn't talk to him for years. And I think, like, the first time I talked to him was actually at, uh, his sister's uh, quinceanera, his, her sister's 15th right. birthday party. And the last time I saw Jessica was like when she was like five. So that was like 10, that was wow. like a 10 year difference, yeah. a 10 year gap between like, you know, him being babysat by my mom and then, you know, seeing him. So I saw him and we, it was like, it was like those 10 years didn't exist. You yeah. know, like we, we, we talked and like, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, like he, he, uh, at that time he was super into art for me. Uh, I was always kind of like treating art as a hobby really because mm -hmm. like there was mm -hmm. no sort of role model that i had where they said you should do art they just said yeah continue doing art but like i didn't know about animation i didn't know anything about mm -hmm. the curve field movies were the thing that inspired me deeply you know like i wanted to get into movies but i didn't really know what it took to get to that point i right. just knew that i wanted to do that and so uh when i ran into joel uh we were talking about the last of us because i had played that game and uh him and i just loved that game it's like it's like one of our favorite games ever and mm -hmm. he had like the art of book and everything and, like, at that time, he was already doing digital art. And I was like, what, what, what is this? What, yeah. What, Where are the what? markers? What? Yeah. Oh, my God. Was, I've been lied to. Like, you know, <laughs> my potential has decreased. And so, like, uh, he was, like, showing me all this digital art. I'm like, whoa, dude, you got to show me sometime. Blah, blah, blah. Because at that time, I, I I still, like, I was okay at drawing. But, like, I, I knew only how to do traditional art. Mm. And at that time, I still didn't know really mm. where my trajectory was going to go. And he was like, yeah, I want to do concept art for video games, blah, blah, blah. And his stuff was amazing. I was like, wow, like this guy. And I felt like a tinge of like 
uh, regret in the sense of like, oh, I wish I had like that drive, you know? Mm. And at that time he said he was going to OSHA and like that made sense because he had like the resources uh, and people to like motivate him to go that route. Which for people uh, who don't know, just by the way, mm-hmm. is uh, the Orange County School of the Arts, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, like, so he went to this fancy schmancy art school. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. We, like, we yeah, just like a school for artists. And I'm like, I went to Western High School. Like, you know, like we had like <laughs> one art teacher, uh, Miss Moyne, who I'm shouting out because she was the like one person who was like the true like art role model for me. Mm. She's a fine artist, but like she like was the one that really motivated me to pursue art as a career. Um, Cause I come from a Latino family where uh, it's it's seen in in a good light to take the more conventional route, you know, like being a doctor, lawyer, mm-hmm. lawyer, or any sort of like one of the more conventional routes that are seen here. Because um, in Mexico, it's more conventional to have someone become a lawyer because usually, like in, in Mexico or in like the more poor areas of Mexico, um, people just work, you know, in the farms or they work selling, you know, treats uh, on the road and stuff. And mm-hmm. so, like my parents wanted that for me. And so she was the one that said, you know, like, you know, you can make a living doing art. And it meant a lot to me because, like, my parents supported me in doing art, but they did, they, they were skeptical because they were just right. afraid that I would, I wouldn't be able to accomplish that goal because they just didn't know what it took to yeah. get to that point. Right. And yeah. so Joel and I, like, you know, we would always kind of, like, comfort each other in the sense that, you know, let's just keep doing what we're doing um, because we kind of felt alone, you know. I felt more mm-hmm. alone as an artist because no one in my community really had that sensibility of doing art i was just on my own mm. and i felt kind of outcasted in a way mm. not not in, in a really bad way but in the sense that like there's no one else that i can talk to to say hey like i want to do this you know and like someone else saying yeah you know like we we can both do it together and uh ever since then we've been best friends and we were just like we'd always motivate each other because like as artists artists being an artist is a tough job mentally mm-hmm. especially because it's always a mind game of having to you know juggle with your emotions you can be on such a high when you complete a project or on such a high when someone gives you the highest praise but then that really doesn't matter because then you are your own worst critic and you always feel down about yourself and so him and i would always try to find ways to like lift each other up mm-hmm. and yeah. so uh even till this day you know like i know a lot of us you know a lot of people are struggling to find jobs and stuff but for me it's like i'm just trying to like motivate him to keep going because it's it's a mind game you know yeah he was committed before me i just kind of got lucky i'm that kind of guy's like i want to be an artist <laughs> And then it's like, no, 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 oh, internship. And then it's like, oh, my God, revisionist. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like for me, like, I didn't work. I mean, people will say I work hard. I, I worked really yeah, hard. But like, but thank you. But like, for me, it's just, I felt like I kind of stumbled upon it because I know there are other people who were, were further along than me because they had learned about digital art before me. And, you know, they had decided their route faster than me. But uh, yeah, like Joel and I, like Joel's my brother, really. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying not to get emotional. You, you know yeah. me, I get emotional. I can bust out the Kleenexes, yeah. you yeah. know? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, our friendship like goes beyond just a friendship. It's like, it's a, it's a brotherhood. And mm. uh, I hope that like, you know, all of us can work in the industry together and, you know, be together because the industry really is, it's like, it's like school 2.0. You go, <laughs> if you step into DreamWorks, really, it's like there's these pots, which are basically like these like circular, half, cubes, circular right? cubes. Yeah. Uh, and so like you it's basically kind of like like a desk split up into like it's like if you take a pie and you kind of you know cut pieces of it basically a piece of it's like a like your own the little little animator pies exactly yeah Yeah. little miguel over here yeah there's miguel and there's the other and there's production (laughs) and so uh basically it's kind of like how i would envision us being in school where it's like if you have the artist in one pot it's like it's like you have your friends there you know and so like the industry is kind of like that where it's like you have you as an artist, you have another person as an artist, and it's like school, but now you're actually, your art isn't graded. It's 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 going to be seen by the entire world, you know? Right. And so that's the thing that I'm looking forward to, you know, with Joel and, and everyone else is uh, being able to experience that, that environment and realizing mm. that it's not really different. It's just now your art is mm. for a TV show, and now it's for a company, and now it's for people to see. Crazy. Just, I was going to say, so, like, a piece of advice that you would give to a Mm -hmm. younger artist to seek out friends or some kind of a community that is also interested in what you're interested in? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Because art can be a very lonely thing to do. uh, But if you love it so much, then it doesn't become lonely. It's sort of like a choice for you to just be in the comfort of your own art. And I think a lot of people have um, opinions to say about school. Like, school can be overly expensive. And, you know, a lot of times it may not be worth it. But to me, having that one person that speaks the same language as you career wise is the best thing. It pushes you forward. 
and it motivates you you know like even if say like a lot of people are you know if you're more of the introverted type just having someone who is the same as you both you know on like an attitude basis and also just like a career wise it speaks volumes because it's just that energy that propels you to move forward so i would say it's super encouraging to like kind of get out of your comfort zone if you're shy to to experience that sense of community with people it's super Mm -hmm. important yeah and that's what i was gonna say too because not only did you guys have each other you've Mm -hmm. been able to spur each other on in Mm -hmm. work hard but also too you've been able to since we were just talking about high school just touch on this real quick i think Mm -hmm. if i remember correctly you'd be able to go back and inspire kids from your own high school or Mm -hmm. To, uh, you know, get into animation or just that there's an art community out there. So I think that's awesome, man. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so with that, what I want to lead into is because I do want to talk about school. But more than that, I want to get into you transitioning from school and Mm -hmm. not even knowing about digital art Uh to this internship at DreamWorks TV. So how did that even come about? Okay. Oh, man. All right. I know it's a long story. No, no, no. It's perfect. (laughs) Uh, So it was actually... it was like a couple of years ago. I think it was like two, almost three years ago, where I had just gotten off an internship. Actually, uh, let me backtrack a little more. So I was trying to find an internship. It was my the end of my junior year. And thankfully, I came across a sign or a flyer for a, a chance to go to Denmark to study abroad. And it was during the summer. And it was like this kind of hybrid thing where it was like through the graphic design department. But it was like an internship study abroad hybrid, which is really cool. I signed up for that. And then... Um, I got accepted because uh, in the end they didn't need to see our portfolio and also because like I went to orientation so I'm lucky I'm nice. super lucky wow. so like I dodged the bullet with having to send in my portfolio because I had no portfolio <laughs> it was just it, it just constant my portfolio <laughs> consisted of like life drawings and like still life drawings and stuff like that and that was and like I was really good at rendering stuff out that's what I learned in high school and that was kind of like my biggest crutch is that like I was good at rendering stuff oh look at me I'm so good at drawing and then yeah. it's like wait no like What I want to do requires more than that. So the internship in Denmark was my first real big step into digital art because Mm. I didn't know any of it. I think I was like the one person who didn't know digital art. I think I was like the young, like one of the younger people in the internship. Like a lot of people were like in the illustration program, but they're like 25, 26. And I met um, a good friend of mine who's actually my roommate in Denmark, uh, Nick Bockelman, who is actually, I don't know if he's still teaching in Cal State Fullerton, but he's a, he was a grad student. And um, he would teach uh, digital illustration. And um, I'm going to shout out to him because he was the one person that really motivated me to pursue digital art. And so uh, him and I were roommates. And that internship really kind of like gave me that first big challenge of like, okay, I need to do something creatively. You know, like we had to uh, redesign a uh, the image of a nature group uh, mm-hmm. called Nature Moda. And it's basically a, a, like an environmentalist group in Denmark that focuses on like, you know, preserving the environment, you know, yeah. focusing on nature. And we had to redesign their logo and we had to redesign their branding for it. And I, I wasn't a graphic design guy. I'm just like, oh, I don't want to draw. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, I could draw people. I could draw, you know, trees. Yeah. And, so, and then there's people That's like designing. Yeah. And it ended up working because, I mean, it was nature. So I was able to draw some, some like, nature-esque kind of, you know, designs. But it was really, like, me actually thinking. Like, mm. like trying to come up with stuff from imagination. And so Nick Bachelman taught me how to use the pen tool in Illustrator. And I had my, I bought my Wacom tablet. I didn't know how to use it. And so then he's like, just use the pen tool. And that saved my butt. Because yeah. I went from, here's my illustration. And it actually wasn't half bad, but it was just kind of like something I pieced yeah, together. together. Right. And I was like, wow, this is a really good illustration. I'm like, oh my God. Okay, cool. All right. Just know that I didn't really put much time and effort into it. But um, that was my first step. And then after that, I interned. Because what's weird is that, like, you know how in the internship class, you, you need 120 hours of internship uh, service. So that internship in Denmark was like 60 hours of it. So it was like only one half of it. Oh, okay. we actually so it was had pretty a, short. Yeah. Then we actually had to find another internship that same summer. Hmm. And so I was trying to scramble for an internship. And um, Nick Bachelman, again, saved my butt. He referred me to this internship uh, at OC Waste and Recycling. Hmm. It was the same thing, graphic design. And so I, I basically, I, you know, sent in my resume application and I interviewed and I got hired right away because um, they, they liked my work. And uh, I... I interned from that for a little bit, and at that time, I was telling people, yeah, I want to get into animation, I want to do this, I want to do that, but I was skeptical, you know, because I still didn't have the skill set, and so then I, and then now leading into your question. No, this is good. <laughs> I want to hear all this. Yeah. The prefacing is good, because it, it kind of shows, like, the journey for me was incremental, like, little things kind of gave mm. me that sense of motivation, like, okay, like, I need to achieve this now, I need to achieve this now. So, lo and behold, uh, Joel is in that class in digital illustration, 
um, with Nick Bockelman. <laughs> and, um, and that's when I first learned digital art. And like, that was the class where I finally realized that like, I'm not one of the best in the class, you know, like I'm just like one of those subpar people. And I, and at that time I didn't enjoy that idea of like me not being that overachiever kind of person, but it was, it was good for me. Like it was essential for me to realize that like, I'm way far off. I also met jo- Josie uh, Dickinson in that class. Yeah. Oh my Shout gosh. Shout out to she's Josie. So good. Oh my gosh. She was really good to begin with in the, in, you know, in that class. And this was like two years ago. And I remember seeing one of her drawings and I like my heart dropped just because I realized, wow, like I'm not working hard enough, you know, mm-hmm. starting off in high school, like I, I had worked hard, but I only focused on the class assignments, not so much my individual growth. Mm. I would always get, I would always be fueled by people's compliments on my work, but I wouldn't really be fueled by my own desire to get better. It was just mm-hmm. like, Hey, people are telling me I'm good. Okay. I guess I need to go this route, Yeah, you know? And so that class really made me understand that. I'm not that great, you know. I'm I'm someone who really needs to step it up because all these people are my competition, uh, and I need to be able to get to that level because I want to get a job. Mm-hmm. And so that's when I realized I need to step it up. And like Joel, he he had actually watched Over the Garden Wall, which was like a, like it transformed him. You know, it was a cool thing to see because he realized that like animation could go that route. It can go on that compelling story route that could inspire people completely. And so that's when he realized that he wanted to do animation. And it was cool seeing that because then I realized, okay, cool. Like, you know, having seen the show after that, I realized, yeah, like, you know, I want to go this route because I feel like animation has something that a lot of live action shows don't, which is they can make something look very appealing and very, very cute and make the story so compelling that the contrast between that is just so impressive that you're like, Hmm. this story that could be cutesy and safe is actually something more powerful than you would see in a live action film or, mm. or, or, or TV show where the tone is already set. Mm. The tone in an animation film kind of like is used as, to its advantage where it's like people expect, oh, whatever, it's going to be a cute show. But then you realize, whoa, this was deep. Like this show really spoke to me on, on a really deep level, which a bunch of shows that I've seen in live action really haven't done for me. Animation mm. has really had those moments where like it really spoke to me. I'm like, wow. And mm. so having that be the feel for me to get better at digital art just like propelled me into that next level and so then uh at the end of uh, actually senior year my fourth year uh, i was still trying to like figure out what to do and everything and uh i made the decision um to try to stay an extra year to pursue an internship and so uh i actually had taken um Mike Dietz class. That's the next class. Mike Dietz, shout out. I know yeah. people Woo! mention Mike Dietz, but there's a reason why because he <laughs> he's the man. He, he he is America's treasure. Really. Yeah. <laughs> like Nicholas he, Cage he, exactly. him on yeah. the back of the Declaration forget, of Independence. Yeah. Forget, forget <laughs> Paul Rudd and Ant Man. All right. Like yeah. This is Mike Dietz in animation. That guy. He he is a legend. He really is. And so, then, I was looking up storyboarding. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. And I think I found like a picture of like an, a sample assemble like layout spread of like uh like like panels across rows and stuff and it was for uh brave and i saw that and there's something about the drawing style that spoke to me i hadn't really seen like the whole like sketchy kind of rough style and for me i was like whoa okay and that just that spoke to me immediately because for me i've always been a drawer i've never really been a painter um i always drew in sketchbooks as a kid i always drew like in notebooks i always wrote stories i always drew with pencil and so like having that digital art medium be that next step for me and being a digital sketcher storyboarding was that route and i had no idea how to do storyboarding like i didn't know anything about like layer comps i didn't know anything about like pacing i just thought i want to do this and so i did like a storyboarding project for barbara malley's class towards the end um and then i applied for a disney internship i applied for like the story internship and i thought oh, i could get in but then i realized that like after seeing other people's storyboards and like Mike Dietz class, I'm like, no, I really effed up. Like, like this is not... I thought I was so cool. Yeah. I thought I knew how to draw. The layouts that I had sent to the, app- the application for Disney were just completely wrong. My life drawings were subpar. The wildlife drawings were okay. And then I was still applying for internships. And then in Mike Dietz class, uh, that was the class where it really kicked my butt. Like, Mike Dietz, he's a great guy. He's honest. But, like, but he's honest. Yeah. And I love that. And I think for me, that was like a next step in me personally, as a person artist, is to take the critique. And again, that's another class where I realized I'm not the best in the class. 
You know, like Diego Rosales. Another shout out, oh, Diego yes. Rosales. We got to get him on the podcast. That super humbling guy, but he was showing stuff, and I'm like, you son of a. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. Oh no, it's okay. I'm like, no, it's great. It's beautiful. Because he would show like his visit of art, and it'd be amazing. And then mm-hmm. I realized, okay, like I need to learn from these people. You know, I need to, kind of like you know, I need to like you know break down this ego that I have of being you know, this good artist and like realizing that there's other people who are way better than me and I need to accept that. I can't be jealous of that because I would, you know, to be honest, I would have jealousy towards people who were better than me because I thought, man, like I want, I want to be that person, you know, I want to be at that level. And so, I still have that toward you, so oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> just I don't kidding. know you. So. Yeah. <laughs> and at that time, I was I was trying to find internships, and I was struggling, and like I was feeling very down about myself, but I was still motivated too because that light bulb went off. I'm like, I need to work my butt off. I need to do something to catch up because these people are gonna destroy me, and they're gonna be nice about it, but they're gonna destroy me on a artistic <laughs> level because they're gonna get jobs, and I'm not. So it was out of fear, kind of. But at the same time, like, you know what? Like, this whole time, I've just been focusing on the assignments that I've been given. I would do the assignment, I'd go home, and I wouldn't really think about it. Or, no, I, or I'd go home and work on the assignment. But not really understanding, like, how am I getting better? You know, like, how? Yeah. what am I trying to do to improve myself? I'm improving myself as a student, but I'm not improving myself as a person and as, as a future artist. Yeah. You know, because I love the animation. And the storyboards I did in my these class were, like, the first true indication that I loved animating, in a sense. Even though, even though I never animated a single thing. I realized that for me, I always like storytelling. Um, I actually wrote a script uh, for my honors project. I think it was like my my fourth year, and um, but I also like drawing. And so storyboarding was that perfect combination of storytelling and drawing. And seeing your storyboards kind of come to life was something that like I, I will never forget that feeling. I'm like, wow, like this is this is my calling. This is what I wanted to do because I love film mm-hmm. and I love drawing. And so those two things combined together it was just like a, a pure rush of euphoria. And so a huge, this is the biggest shout out I'm going to give in the podcast. A huge <laughs> shout out to Laura Neal, who, who yeah. who's a uh, career art specialist at Cal State Fullerton. Mm-hmm. And she focuses primarily on helping you with your resumes and cover letters um, for internships, uh, for full-time jobs, etc. cetera. And uh, she was the one that, she was my rock. Like she, when I, when I started my journey, uh, finding, finding internships, uh, like over like a year prior to getting the DreamWorks one for an entire year, she was helping me out with, you know, sprucing up my resume sprucing up my cover letter finding things in there that would make make me a qualifying candidate or so an appealing candidate and we applied for all these big companies uh disney nickelodeon cartoon network and she would always say like you know this is this is probably it you know that like i feel comfortable about this i feel i feel like this is a a, a good step good this is a guarantee you, yeah. yeah and um when i would get that rejection letter she'd be like wow like i didn't I, I seriously thought you were shooing. You know, she was so motivating. And she wasn't just sugar, sugarcoating it. Like, she would be motivating, and then she would be genuinely surprised by the fact that I didn't get mm-hmm. the internship. She's like, I thought you were a qualifying candidate. I thought you were shooing. And for that happened for a year, and there was a point where, like, I was almost going to stop. Uh, because, that, you know, it, it takes a toll on you mentally because you're like, will I, will I be in animation? Will I be just a person who just talks about what could have been? And that was the thing that, like, you know, mortified me. Like, I didn't want to be the person to end up telling people, yeah, you know, you don't always achieve your dreams. I didn't want to be that person, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that was the thing that horrified me. And so she was she was my rock the entire time, always motivating me, always finding something to give me that little push to, to continue. And I applied to DreamWorks, like, three or four times before that. And then she did something where she said, okay, Noah, like, you've done it. You've, you've interned or you've pursued finding an internship this long. Uh, I'm gonna help you out. Like, I, like you know, I, I'm gonna talk to someone and see if the, you know I, I can recommend you for this. And I said, oh, like you don't have to do that. But they said, no, I want to because I've seen you work so hard yeah, for so you long. You put in the work. Yeah. You know, like she she didn't do it in the beginning. You know, she'd always just hope that you know, like someone would pick me just you right know, without having to like you know recommend me. And um, but she said, you know what, like you know, I'm gonna see if I can like help you out. And um, I didn't think about that. You know, I said, okay, cool, awesome. And then in the summertime, I actually got an interview for a Cartoon Network internship. And I was like, okay, cool. This is like, this is awesome. Right. It's leading you know? somewhere. It's leading oh, this somewhere. Work. Yeah. 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 And like, even if it doesn't lead anywhere, like, even if I don't get it, uh, at least I, at least I did something right. At least there was something there. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I, I did the video, video interview. Uh, it was basically like, you know, they have the, the, the system yeah. set up where if you have like a, a laptop with a webcam on it, you record yourself and with the Cartoon Network one, it was interesting because they had pre-recorded questions for you. Hmm. So it'd be like, 
uh, what is something about yourself that is unique, you know, to other candidates? Like, what's something that makes you stand out? And then you had like 60 seconds to respond yeah. to that. So there's always that immediately added pressure. And so I, I thought I did okay. And then um, n- n- no one got back to me in the end. Mm-hmm. Like, it was, mm-hmm. it was done. I'm like, oh, whatever. And then lo and behold, the first day back in my last year at Cal State Fullerton, uh, I get an email from DreamWorks Animation saying, hey, you know, we, we want to meet with you. You know, we were wondering if you had time to talk talk over the phone. I thought, oh, great. And so we spoke over the phone and I knew that this was it. Like there's something where like the stakes <clears throat> were have never been higher. Like this, this, is, yeah. this yeah. is this is the defining thing for me. This, this could change my life. Yeah. There's something about it where the, the gravity of it was just so big that uh-huh. I, I just didn't want to mess up. And so the process was actually very smooth. Um, they talk to you over the phone. It's not a phone interview. It's not like a cold call thing. They let you know, hey, we want to talk to you. Uh, but I thought it was going to be an interview because I know on Nickelodeon, they do those yeah, cold they calls. Yeah, they do that. Yep. Uh, but now they're not really so cold because you know what the area code is. Yeah. It's, like, it's Nickelodeon. It's not a voicemail. And then they'll say, hey, I'm blah, blah, blah from Nickelodeon. And you're like, haha, okay. Yeah. Right, now I know it's you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm guilty of that because I see, like, oh, it's, it's a Burbank area code. Okay, fine. I'll just let it go to voicemail. I'm like, oh, it's it's uh, Mary from Nickelodeon. Awesome. You know? Yeah, oh, write down sorry. that name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was doing something. I'm sorry I didn't pick up the phone. Yeah. But then you're just staring and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but at DreamWorks, it was like, they called you and like, it wasn't an interview. It was basically, uh, they asked you about like, you know, why you want to be in the internship, uh, like what your hours are. And it was crucial for me to like set up time uh, in my schedule to have like two full days um, off for the internship. And then especially having a day off being a Friday, because usually that's like one of the busiest times uh, at DreamWorks, or at least for any company to work is on a Friday. And so I made it, uh, I, I planned ahead to where like my schedule had those two days available. Mm-hmm. And so I said, oh, yeah, I'm available on Tuesday and on Friday. And they said, okay, awesome. And then uh, the person I actually talked to went to Cal State Fullerton. So like oh, I kind of wow. I kind of ribbed off of that. I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. So what you major in? Mm-hmm. Oh, I majored in business. Oh, cool, awesome. And so then like uh, she asked me like, you know, when I'd be bill for the interview, and this is funny because she, she I, I said, I'm available on Friday for the interview. She says, well, I don't know if Friday would be good. I'm like, oh, shoot. She sure, shouldn't have said yeah, that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, it goes through your mind. Because then it's like, oh, we have to do a video call. And my previous experience with the video call at Cartoon Network, I was like, no, nah, I want to be able to be there. The, be yeah, there yeah, I want to yeah. be able to find an excuse to visit, visit the studio. And I thought, oh, well, I have a plain air painting class, but also it was the first week, so... We weren't going to actually be outside, you know, um, you know, doing uh, landscape painting. Uh, I was just going to be in class. I'm like, oh, I have to, like, you know, find time to, like, you know, get out of class and do the interview. Like, I, I'll do whatever it takes. And so then, I, okay, cool. We'll see if we can find find a way. And then the next day, uh, again, surprising me a little bit more, the interview was set for Friday. It was oh, wow. set for Friday. And there's something there. I was like, okay, all right. Like, there's something good about it. I didn't get my hopes up. But I thought, okay, there's something there. And, um... They're willing to make it work for you. Exactly. Right? Like, yeah. okay, there's something there. Like, if they're, yeah, if they're willing to make, you know, if they're willing to make it work for me, then there's something good. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I didn't want to, I didn't want to jinx Get it. Get your hopes up, right? Yeah, yeah I don't want to be like, oh, sorry, you know what? Never mind. We don't want to interview you, you know? That's always that fear in your head. Yeah. But, uh, uh, then I'm like, okay, cool. So I basically watched, like, as many TV shows as I could that DreamWorks <laughs> produced. Yeah. That's, that's tip number one. Watch the content that the company that you're interviewing for makes. Because mm-hmm. it, because they ask, they actually asked me and they will ask you what's your fa- what's one of your favorite shows that we've produced and if you say and if you're at DreamWorks uh, and you say Bambi then you're like you know what I mean like just, <laughs> you know what I mean like they, yeah, don't 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 say ruined. yeah don't don't say Frozen at DreamWorks or don't yeah. say Shrek at Disney you know yeah, like, exactly. it's one of those things where you know you have to know what the company's producing and so I watched Voltron I watched Troll Hunters and I actually liked those shows a lot it was cool like you actually get to you know because for, for those listening this was dreamers tv dreamers they, tv yeah. yeah and this was production or did it, you know at that time it was a it was a production internship and i actually did not know what it entailed uh okay. i would always be applying for development intern and thinking that it was like kind of like pre-production where it's like development you're developing the art you know i was thinking yeah. more in school terms but development is actually like developing shows so it's more like script driven hmm. and so with production it's mainly mainly you're there in the production of a show you're not an artist but you're there helping the artists and and keeping things on track so you're basically Mm -hmm. reporting to all the different departments on the show whether it be the storyboarding department the design department this the animation department production is that that avenue that pipeline that leads to those departments Mm -hmm. and when i finally realized what that was it made sense to me Mm because i never i didn't apply to those i always applied to the development that's that's always like a 
misconception is the terminology doesn't really, or like the name of the position doesn't really determine like what what people's uh, vision of it would be. Gotcha. Like people don't really know what production is. And so knowing that, I applied for production. And at that point, I kind of knew what it was. I didn't really know what the animation pipeline was. And that's kind of fine because really it's like in the on the website for the company that you're applying for, it could say, we need someone with this much experience, blah, blah, blah. You yeah. need to know Maya. You need to know blah, blah. That's all BS, to be honest. The, mm. At least part of it. Because you can, even if you don't have, like, say, a year's experience of a certain thing, it doesn't matter, you know? Like, certain things matter where, like, if you know Shotgun, that helps, especially at DreamWorks, because DreamWorks uses Shotgun as, like, their file task okay. manager. Yeah. And um, it basically keeps the production all together yeah. in one place so you mm-hmm. can keep track of where it is along the exactly. pipeline. Exactly. Yeah. And you, uh, you can be a little greenhorn, which is basically, like, you being new to the industry. Like, mm-hmm. they don't want someone to be so experienced in something. They actually encourage people who, like, say their previous experience of working at Starbucks. That doesn't matter. The biggest thing is that you are in school, uh, you're pursuing any, you're pursuing a career that's related to the arts, whether it be film, uh, TV, illustration, animation, as long as you have that under your belt, that's cool. And then also too, like having a love for animation. Mm -hmm. If you're just there, just trying to get an internship and not have a love for animation, then why bother? Because then your attitude kind of sinks in and, and you realize that if you're in animation and you don't love it, then your attitude kind of trickles down to other people and they mm. realize this person's not enjoying it, you know? And it kind of ruins... It takes one person to ruin or make a uh, company culture or mm-hmm. a show culture. Yeah. And so having that love for animation is cool. And then having some experience uh, in in Shotgun, at least. Yeah. Um, but it's all subjective, really. Like, if you're some... You know, and also, if you have a portfolio link, that helps, too. Because then that, that'll show, like, what your... your uh, your interests are hmm. but also to like having an interest in production you know looking at those keywords of you know being good with other people uh you know being proactive uh reporting um you know being being a big communicator big collaborator those are the things that they look for <clears throat> and it's all transferable so like it doesn't have to be specifically animation it can be anything from you know you work at a starbucks and you know you're using customer service you you know how to use yeah. uh the equipment you know how to work under pressure, work yeah, under pressure. That, yeah. knowing how to deal with people knowing how to report to your boss, your supervisor, showing up on time, you know, yeah. uh, you know, communicating with your supervisor if you're late or if you're going to be sick. Those are the things that they look for, because basically production, the biggest thing in production is that you can teach people the skills and the software, but you can't teach people how to have a good attitude. You can't teach yeah. attitude. Mm-hmm. Attitude is something that's just ingrained in you from your previous experiences. So if you're a jerk. You can't teach someone how not yeah. to be a jerk. It's easier to teach someone how do you shotgun. It's easier to teach someone how to yeah. open up an OBJ file, which is basically like like a it's a three D object 3D, file, a three yeah. D object file. Um, that's easier. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, what well, does production actually entail at mm, DreamWorks TV? Mm. And then we'll go from there. Yeah. Okay. Production is like the most um, extroverted or social uh, division, or at least department on a show. So they're the ones that keep track of everything. So um, production keeps track of the scheduling of the show. And there's this thing called the bar schedule. And if you look up like animation bar schedule, it's this schedule that kind of slants this way. And production keeps track of a certain episode. So there are three three production teams usually on a show. At DreamWorks, there are three production teams. And they each keep track of every third episode. So one team gets the first episode. The second team gets the second episode third team so on and then they they go every third episode so like gotcha. if you get the first episode then you're getting the fourth episode next and then the seventh one gotcha. and they keep track of the entire process of an episode starting from the premise of the episode so like someone pitching the premise like oh this episode's gonna be about this to the first draft second draft third draft and then final draft and then um keeping track of like the recordings and stuff and that's actually what the script su- su- the script coordinator does is they, they go to the recordings they meet the voice actors and they're the ones okay. that um, keep track of the audio but production mainly keeps track of like the things that are done within um, the department or at least within the show from writing and then from there to designs so they're the ones that go to the design meetings and that's where like the designers are assigned uh, the designs they're working on from designing props, backgrounds, yeah. environments. And on a CG show, it's mainly just like the props and the characters that they design. And there's a character designer for that, for mm-hmm. the characters. And the production just follows along to then storyboarding, where with storyboards, I know that's the meat of what this thing is. Um, that's where they go to 
where the storyboard designers or the storyboard artists are launched onto their their storyboards and for anyone interested in storyboarding really how it works is um with storyboarding uh you get like a third of the script so if it's like a 22 minute episode Mm -hmm. you get a third of that and so the borders get three board artists per team they get a third of that script and production keeps track of their progress and then once that's done then you know they they put the storyboards together into the animatic and then from there, they go all the way to finish to where, like, they're keeping track of, like, the animation and the comps, you know, mm-hmm. like, like seeing the textures put on, the lighting put on. And that's really what production entails, where you're, you're supporting the artists, you're supporting the writers, making sure that they have what they need, making sure that they're on top of their deadlines. And you're going to a lot of meetings. It's, like, one of the mo- it's one of the busiest. And I feel like the fact that they're, they're I feel like they're really underpaid because I was in production. <laughs> yeah. And you're, you're having to keep track of a lot. You have to unpack files for the animators to work on and for the comp, the comp artists to work on and for the effects artists to work on. And this is for CG shows and the same is, is set for 2D shows, the same kind of pipeline yeah. where it's like you have to unpack files to give to the artists mm-hmm. and making sure that they don't have to do the extra work. And with production, it's mainly seeing, making sure those episodes go from start to finish and you know there will be challenges along the way, but really it's you're you're your, your the glue. Production is the glue of the show, and without them, like basically the departments are just kind of like you know, it's like just like decapitated heads, like you know like yeah. they, they don't they, chickens running yeah the, they, yeah the, the production is the nervous system, and mm-hmm. for anyone interested in production, um, and you want to go up until like you know being a line producer and stuff like that. Really, a line producer just keeps track of like the the bigger picture stuff, mm-hmm. the budgeting, and the scheduling. But really, being like being an artist and wanting to, and you know wanting to be an artist and being in production, that's a great segue and a mm-hmm. great transition into being an artist, and so that's what production entails. It's busy work. It's not really. It's a skilled job in the sense that you're you're trained on the job. It's just it's hard to train before that. It's hard to be qualified before that. Right. That's only if you've been in production before. So, what's funny is that the line producer. A shout out to uh, Mercedes Salazar who was. Uh, my rock, she was my supervisor from, from being an intern and my supervisor being on Kung Fu Panda as a PA. Um, she said that, like, basically, she doesn't expect her PAs to know anything, which kind of sounds uh, like an insult, but really it's like, <laughs> it puts less pressure on you to yeah. all of a sudden come in on your first day and having to know I know anything. everything, yeah, exactly. yeah, which you yeah. don't. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And embracing mistakes. So yeah. uh, for anyone wanting to be an artist, production is a good route, especially if you are applying for DreamWorks Animation or DreamWorks TV, they're very flexible with that. Other companies, that's that's where you have to kind of know how the companies are with that kind of, you know, transition. Because sometimes some companies don't want you to transition from a certain role. They want you to stay right. just in production. Yeah. At least with feature, it's a lot harder. But in TV, it's a lot more flexible. Hmm. So if you want to be a feature artist, it's easy to start off in TV and then move on to feature. Because at least with TV, they're more flexible with you moving up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you have kind of transitioned into mm-hmm. an artist right mm-hmm. so how did that transition uh-huh. kind of take place yeah uh so when i interviewed for the the internship position um they liked me because of the fact that i loved animation and i wanted to do that and i actually talked about my script uh that actually was the thing that got me hired so i interned for two semesters and then two weeks prior to me leaving um uh, the internship i actually Mer- mercedes came up to me and she said hey so one of the production coordinators is leaving uh which means that one of the PAs is getting promoted to production coordinator, which means that a spot's open. Mm-hmm. And she asked, do you want the position? And then at that moment, there was a pause. And I thought, is this really happening? Because yeah. I had heard other intern, former interns talk about how things like that happened to them, where yeah. they got their job right away or some of them had gaps. Mm-hmm. And so I started off as a PA right away. And so um, I graduated uh, May 19th. And that's the funny thing is that during my internship, my last internship, because I interned two semesters Mm -hmm. uh, in the fall of 2017 and then the spring of uh, 2018, um, she had always asked me, when do you graduate? When do you graduate? And I said, May 19th, May 19th. I always made it clear, May 19th. And I thought, okay, is she setting something up? I don't know. And that's the thing with if you're interning or if you want to pursue an internship, uh, there's always no no guarantee of getting a job right after graduation. Mm -hmm. You either have to wait or... You might get lucky like like I did and get the job right away. It's just a matter of what the show needs. Um, shows end, but other shows begin. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times it's just being there at the right time and, yeah. and following up with people. And so for me, I was lucky enough to have someone leave the company to then give right. me the spot. Yeah. To, to then be That's like, okay, awesome. cool, yeah. yeah. And, had, and being an intern on Kung Fu Panda, The Positive Destiny, which you should check out on Amazon Prime. Shut up, shut up. Oh, shit. <laughs> so being, interning on that show was basically me 
was basically an interview for me. It was basically like a really prolonged interview process for me. It was yeah, basically it was them interview. testing you out, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, and, exactly. and you, just like you did in school, just like you uh-huh. did all throughout, you succeeded because you worked hard. Mm-hmm. And they saw that, and they hired you on. That's yeah. awesome. And that's a crucial thing is, you know, you got to be nice. You know, you don't want to be a jerk, and you want to be motivated to work hard. And that's something that she saw in me. She's like, I think she's the only Latina latina line producer at dreamworks mm. other there are other women um as line producers at dreamworks but she's like the only latina and that really inspired me because uh we're still underrepresented as minorities uh, mm. in animation but just seeing someone who kind of speaks the same language as you culturally that's mm-hmm. really cool and she saw that in me uh knowing that i worked hard and so i came on as a pa <laughs> so i graduated may 19th and then <laughs> i had a break i had a day in between my start date because she basically said okay you, you graduate on a Saturday, you start on Monday. So yeah. I basically had to start right after so I May graduated. May 21st or May whatever. May 21st, yeah, yeah. You're here. Exactly. So I had a day in between um, graduating and starting work to have a graduation party. And thank you so much for coming to that. Oh, that yeah. Really cool. Yeah, that and was so much for, fun. I still have your card. I had fun. It was great. Uh, I cried because like it was sort of like me kind of accomplishing what my parents were kind of worried about was like, yeah. will I be able mm-hmm. to accomplish that? And, you know, my, my dad immigrated from Mexico and he got deported once and then he tried again. And, like, that story, like, always struck a chord with me because he persisted. And I didn't want to let those hundreds of miles of him crossing, like, be for nothing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so, for me, that was something that really, you know, has always hit me. Every time, like, I go to work, even now, I always think of that. And so, like, you know, for me, that was a chance for me to kind of, like, thank everyone. And that concludes part one one of Christian and my conversation with Miguel Baltazar. And, you know, a few takeaways that I had, I hope you guys enjoyed it too, was talking about uh, the friends and community of artists that he had growing up and how that really shaped him. And of course, you know, I love that he talked about Joel, whom Christian and I had on the podcast way back, I think in episode five. Uh, Joel's a great guy. And, And because of the art that Joel was doing, it influenced Miguel to go in this direction so that now he's at DreamWorks TV in the industry. It's crazy. So also too, uh, I love that Miguel talked about uh, going to other people for help, even with your resume. You know, sometimes I think we just think about, oh, I got to work on my portfolio or oh, my art, this and that. But sometimes maybe we're missing out on jobs just because our resumes don't look right or they don't have the right uh, information on them. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then also, too, uh, Miguel talking about the script that got him hired, or at least talking about that he had written a script. Uh, I think what he was saying with that is that DreamWorks TV really recognized his passion for filmmaking, and that carried over into him getting his internship. And so in part two, Christian and I had the opportunity to talk about Miguel's transition from being, you know, a production intern to a production assistant, and now a storyboard revisionist, which is really what Miguel wanted to do. And also in part two, Miguel answers your questions. And if you guys go on our YouTube page right now, just Up and Coming Artist Podcast on YouTube, you can actually watch the video of us asking Miguel your questions. Uh, that came to us via Instagram. And while you're on Instagram, be sure to check out Miguel's work, Miguel Baltazar underscore art on Instagram. And if you go on his website, that's miguelbaltazarart.com, you can check out the storyboards that actually got Miguel the job he has now, which he'll talk about in part two. So stick around as Miguel talks about storyboard revisioning at DreamWorks TV. Mm -hmm.